new season, new decade of ministry, new Bible teaching series. We're going to be in the book of First Thessalonians. It's a letter written by Paul. And so I'm really excited. If you want to turn to First Thessalonians chapter one, that's where we're going to be this morning. And here's, here's kind of what, what God has put on my heart for this series. Um, it really just kind of relates to a commercial that I've seen recently. How many of you guys have seen this commercial? I, I think it's from Vanguard Financial Company, but basically it's a father and his little girl, and they're in an urban setting, they're in a city setting, hustle and bustle, they're walking on a sidewalk, and all of a sudden they see this beautiful wildflower, purple wildflower, that's popped up in between the crack in the, in the concrete. And so it's raining in the commercial and the girl goes and gets a, pla a little plastic cup and puts it over the flower to protect it and so that nobody would step on it. And then it, it pans to them coming over and her dad helps her and they, they just carefully pull this flower out, keeping the roots intact. And then they go over to a park that's nearby and behind this bench, there's this empty planter, just dirt, and they, and they dig with their fingers and they plant this little wildflower in this planter, saving the day, rescuing the wildflower. And then all of a sudden it pans to many, many years later. He's now an old man. She's now a young lady. And they're sitting on the bench. And wouldn't you know it, the whole planter is filled with purple wildflowers. It's a beautiful picture I don't know how it relates to Vanguard Financial Commercial, but it absolutely is a beautiful picture. And it's a beautiful picture of what Paul has experienced and why he's writing this letter to the Thessalonians. If you read in the book of Acts, the book of Acts is, comes right after the Gospels. The four Gospels tell us about Jesus' life while he was here up until the point where he died, rose from the dead, and ascended. And then the book of Acts follows up what happened after that. How did the early church get started? And when we look in Acts 17, we see Paul going to Thessalonica and telling them about Jesus. And what he does is he plants this church. He tells people about Jesus. Some people are getting saved. And he plants this small church in Thessalonica. And then there's a bunch of persecution. And so Paul has to leave after about a month. And so he's left this church, like this little wildflower. He's left this church, and he can no longer tend to it. And then a while passes, and he, 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 he says in a letter, I, I think about you often. I wonder about you, how you're doing. And then he sends his, his ministry partner, Timothy. Timothy goes and gives a report that, in fact, what Timothy's found is this church is not struggling at all. This church is not only surviving, this church is thriving. It's like, it's like he planted a little wildflower and then he came back to find a huge bouquet of wildflowers. And so Paul writes this letter saying, I've heard the good news, how good you're doing. And I just want you to keep doing good. And so I, I, I'm titling this series A Transformational Community because it's exactly what we see in Thessalonica. And so if you would stand with me, we'll read this morning our passage from 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 through 6, and we'll dig in this morning and we'll be digging in for a few months into this letter. Paul's writing. Paul says, we always thank God for all of you, making mention of you constantly in our prayers. We recall in the presence of our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor motivated by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full assurance. You know how we lived among you for your benefit, and you yourselves became imitators of us and of the Lord, 
when in spite of severe persecution, you welcome the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. What Paul is, is talking about here is something powerful that he's witnessed. These, this community is a testimony to the transforming power of the gospel. If you're writing in your notes, that's the first fill in. The transforming power of the gospel. Listen to what he says. He says, for we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you. If you're a Bible nerd, when, when we hear this idea of chosen you, chosen ones, that, that, that should point us back to the Old Testament. That's God's people. What, what Paul is saying is, look, you're loved by God. You are now God's people. These people had just heard this message about Jesus. They were, they were either Jewish or they were what the Jewish people would have called pagan. And now they're Christians. Something radical has changed. He's like, you're now God's people. You weren't God's people before I got there. You're now God's people. You're, cho you're chosen. He chose you. Because our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full assurance. So Paul is rejoicing because like the wildflowers, there's something about the gospel that is powerful mysterious and effective. He left and he came back and it was better than when he left it. Something made it better. And Paul's like, that's the gospel. That's the power of the gospel. It has clearly taken root in Thessalonica and it is spreading. And Paul's like, man, I'm so excited about that. Now, when Paul talks about the gospel, it literally means good news. So what Paul has was, basically was there for about a month, and what he was telling them, the gospel, the good news, is all about who God is, what God has done, and what God has promised. He's like, Jesus came and he died. That's who God is. Jesus came and he made the invisible God visible that's the gospel. He came. He, we now have seen God. He, he dwelt among us. And it's what he did. He died on a cross so that we can be forgiven of our sins and we can be reconciled to God, which just means to have a relationship with God. And not only that, he's going to make a really big deal in this letter. Jesus is coming back. He promised to come back. He always keeps his promises. No matter how bad it gets, you notice there's persecution going on. There's hard things going on. No matter how hard it gets, we can always have hope. Jesus is coming back. That's a beautiful thing. That's the gospel. And it's powerful. The gospel is not just information on a page. It's not just something to be studied and memorized. God is real. He's alive. He's active, energizing us. Powerful, transformative. And these people have been chosen, which is to say they've now become, from whatever they were, they've now become people of God. God loves them. And he's now looking at them and saying, in response to God's love for you and you received it with joy, I can see now how much you love God and how much you love each other. And so the gospel has taken full root. And Paul, I think, is blown away. When it's like, honestly, I mean, if, if you just try to put yourself in like, like Paul's a human, right? How many of you guys know Paul was a human, right? How many of you guys are human? Right? So we can relate. So Paul's like, I, I planted this church and then I got like kind of chased out. The, the, the leaders like, like literally were going to kill me or I leave. And so I chose to leave because I felt like God still wanted me to go to other places and tell them about Jesus. So I made the wise decision. So he's saying basically, I didn't really have a lot of hope in you guys. Like I kind of started this thing after a month. I mean, how much rooted can it be? 
And you can imagine, right? Like, I, I did my best, but I didn't have enough time. I wish I had more time. I wanted to teach you more things. And he's like, I wasn't really sure how you guys would be doing. I didn't have a lot of hope in my flesh. Then I sent Timothy back. When Timothy told me how good you guys are doing, I thought to myself, oh, of course. It's not about me and my ability to be there. The Holy Spirit stayed the whole time and the Holy Spirit has been at work the whole time. And this is a testimony to all the people all around the world that God is real and he's powerful and he's active and he's transforming your community. And so Paul's like, boom, I'm so excited. That's how he kicks off this letter. They didn't just receive this as information. They didn't just have a bunch of lists of what's right and what's wrong. They received it as a transformational, life-changing message, which is to say that they were changed from the inside out. It reformed how they thought, it reformed how they loved, and it reformed how they lived. And so Paul describes what he saw specifically in them that was telling him, you guys have changed. The second thing in your notes is that the gospel transforms their why. How many of you guys know that in the Bible, why you do what you do is incredibly important to God? What you do is important. But why you do what you do is incredibly important to God because it points to your heart. It points to your motivation. It points to your intention. Why you do what you do is incredibly important to God. One, I think, honest critique of the Western church today is that it tends to form shallow disciples or what Dallas Willard called people who have just undergone behavior modification. They've learned the right things to do, but under the surface, not a whole lot's changed. That's not what Paul is describing about this church. He literally says, this thing has changed you from the inside out. Your why has changed. Your what has changed, but your why has changed more importantly. And Paul recognizes some really winsome, deep transformation that has taken place in them. He says, we recall in the presence of our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor motivated by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. A why that is transformed by the Spirit always looks like faith, hope, and love. We see that over and over again in the New Testament. These three words combined, faith, hope, and love. It's exactly what Paul describes in them. Your work that was, the, what was the Why? Oh, your faith, your labor. Oh, what was the why? Oh, your love, your endurance. Oh, but what was the why? Oh, your hope, faith, hope, and love. Work produced by faith. Now, faith in the Bible is not just behavior modification. It's not just, oh, all of a sudden I believe the right things. Faith in the Bible is much more, has much more depth than that. Faith in the Bible is literally when we believe that following Jesus is totally worth it. And we, and we rearrange our life around that. To have faith in Jesus means I have decided to follow him, no turning back, no excuses. I mean, I'll fall down, I'll make mistakes, but then I'll get back up again, I'll keep going, right? Faith is what gets you back up again. Faith is what gets you up in the morning. Faith is what gets you to church when you don't feel like it. Faith is transformational. It's work produced by faith. There's a great saying, and I think it's a true saying, that we don't work to be saved. Amen? You don't have to do any work in order to be saved. 
but we are saved, so let's get to work. Paul here, it's interesting. Most of the time, Paul is, is, is noted for, you're, you're not saved by works, you're saved by grace. Here, he says, oh, but yeah, you started working because you have faith. <laughs> works here. Works, the way that he's using it here, which is important when you're reading the Bible. How does, how does this author use these words? These word works here is what we often call spiritual practices. The type of works he's talking about is what we often call spiritual practices. It's literally the simplicity of this. We gather weekly together. It's a, it's a practice that we do together because we're saved, because we have faith. It, it takes work. Growing in the knowledge of the Lord, like reading your Bible, going to Bible study, growing in your knowledge of the Lord, that's a practice. Praying. Praying is a practice. It's a work. Serving. Serving is a practice. It's a work. Giving. What you do with your money really reveals what your priorities are. Giving is a, pra- it's a spiritual discipline, it's a practice. These are all the types of things that Paul is talking about. He's like, look, you guys had faith, you believed that Jesus was worth it, so you started exercising it, you started gathering together regularly, even though you know there was all these kids' birthday parties and all these sporting events and all these things, but you made this a priority and you started coming because you had faith and you believed that Jesus was worth it. And you believed that he was gonna do something when you're together. He believed, we believe there's power in that. And so you started doing it. It was because you had faith. You believed that Jesus was worth it. And you started praying. And you started studying the word. You started asking good questions. And you started, well, they probably didn't listen to podcasts, but we can. We have so much more ability than they did. We should be doing way better than they were. And so they have this faith. And it's prompting them to do work. And then he goes, and then your labor motivated by love. And the word labor here is like perseverance and continuing to do these things that he's talking about, even when it's hard or even when it's uncomfortable, even when you don't feel like it, it's labor. The church in the first century, the church in Thessalonica, in all the churches that Paul was witnessing, they had some enemies. There were enemies. That word would, would, that he was worried about. Like, your faith is doing really good now, but I just worry about you a little bit because there's these things that could come and they could really throw you off. I've seen it a million times. That's what Paul's kind of, that's the heart of this letter. In the first century, there was a major challenges he's gonna bring up. There's cultural ungodliness, temptation. Specifically, he's gonna talk about sexual immorality. The church can get ugly sometimes. He's going to talk about that. And you you get some false teaching and some toxic leadership. That can really cause a lot of damage in a church community. And life will get in the way. So he's going to talk a lot about stay awake. Don't get lulled to sleep. It's easy to get lulled to sleep, right? You just get busy and doing all these things and you just lose that faith that drives you. And this church in Thessalonica seems to be kicking butt, if I can use that term in church. Now, they're kicking butt. But in, and in spite of obstacles, they're, 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 they're like, hashtag winning. But he's worried about them. He doesn't want them to fall asleep. He doesn't want them to lose it. But up till now, their love for God and their love for one another is propelling them. And Paul uses a word for love. It's a Greek word many of you have heard about, agape. Your agape is what's done it. Culturally, the correct vernacular, the the popular term, the, the term the kids would have been using was not agape when they were talking about this. It would have been eros. Eros is the type of what we call love. We translate them both love. Eros is love that you give to something that you think is worth it, that you think is worthy. And Eros is the type of love that you give because you want to get back. I'll give you 
I want back. It's social media love. It's social media love. I love your story. It makes me feel so good. Oh, I'm so jelly of you and all you're doing. I'd love to see that. I got all the feels. It's Eros. Look at your picture. You're so beautiful. You're a boss queen. <laughs> now just repeat that back to me 10 times. It's Eros. This just got stupid. Let's move on. <laughs> but Paul's talking about agape love. Agape love is when we love deeply without merit. We often call it unconditional love. We love something or somebody that has nothing to offer us back and has not done anything to deserve. We just decide to love like God does with us. And it's love for the benefit of others. Matter of fact, Paul says that. He goes, I didn't just come and preach the gospel to you. I shared my very life with you. We shared our life with you. We did life with you. We ate with you. We told stories. We listened to your stories. We did life together, and it was for your benefit. I didn't do that for me. I didn't do that because I needed friends. Paul had friends. I did that for you because I love you, because God loved me, and he sent me to love you. I just wanted to do it really well. And you guys have started imitating me, he says. And so now you have this labor, and I see it. It's motivated by the same love that we brought to you. It's taking root. And there was endurance inspired by hope. Endurance that was inspired in hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. They believed that Jesus was coming back. When Jesus comes back, amen. We believe this, right? Amen. How many of you guys would give an amen to the fact that Jesus is coming back? Amen. How many of you guys would give an amen that when he comes back, he's going to right all the wrongs? Amen. Let's stop panicking, church. He's going to right all the wrongs. It's been written. It will happen. Stop panicking. Stop freaking out. Have hope. That's what he's saying. You guys do, Lord. You got hope. When he comes back, he's going to take us to be with him. He says all the believers, those who are still alive, those who have passed, will all join up together and will be caught up with the Lord and will be with the Lord together forever. That's what he's like, that's the gospel, and that's why you guys should have hope. And I'm, I just watch, like, man, your life honestly kind of sucks a little bit. Like, there, there's persecution. I mean, you're walking to church, and someone jumps out and beats you up. I don't even know what it looked like. They're trying to put you in prison, but you show up anyways. What's that about? But you're enduring because you have that hope. That's what he's saying. RCC. We have the same transformational gospel that this church in Thessalonica had. We have the same Holy Spirit. We have the same hope. What will that produce in us? Will we be a community that's being transformed by the Spirit to be more and more like Jesus and display the goodness of of God everywhere we go, will it take root? I believe it will. <laughs> I believe it can. I believe it's worth it. I believe Jesus is worth it. Amen? Amen. And the gospel takes root in community is the last thing. The gospel takes root in community. Let me ask you this. If there is a God in heaven, and there is, if Jesus came down and showed us who that God is, and he did, if Jesus died on a cross so that we could join together and be family, which he did, if he left us here to be witnesses of his goodness and his gospel, which he did, 
And if he's coming back, and if the, if the gospel takes root in community, and if there's an enemy who hates the Lord and hates us, what do you think he's going to attack? Community. If I can just get them to not hang out together, to not show up, to not be one with one another, to not love one another, serve one another, if I could just get them to do that, then the gospel can't take root. I mean, it still can, but it's going to slow it down. It's not the way God intends it to be. The gospel takes root in community. And he goes, you know how we lived among you. We did life with you. And it was for your benefit. See that? And you yourselves became imitators of us and of the Lord when in spite of severe persecution, you welcomed the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's been noted that the church in America has become a transactional community, not a transformational community. And what that means, a transactional community is business terms. It's like a transaction. I come into your store, you treat me nice. I buy stuff, you can keep being a store, right? It's consumer operated. The church in America, many have pointed out, and I, I just think it's true, and maybe it's sometimes true here even. It becomes this consumer thing. It's transactional. We, the staff, are leaders. We'll give you what you want if you just will show up. We'll make, we'll make it real nice, right? All I want you to do is just show up, though, and affirm me, right? It's transactional. The church in the West has become consumer-driven, and it's in truly... I mean, the, the records show it's in decline. But do you know this? The church in Africa and the church in Asia and the church in Latin America is booming. It is. And do you know the difference? They, they do transformational church. They don't do transactional church. That's the difference. The gospel takes root in community. People who have decided to follow Jesus and have decided to bind together and make each other a priority. Make community a priority. Those churches are growing in ways that you wouldn't believe and the youth culture in Africa and Asia and Latin America is leading the charge. When we look at today's youth, it's like, oh, do we have any hope? In Africa and Asia, it's like, they're like, they're taking over. They're, making, they're putting everyone else to shame. What's the difference? They approach church way differently than we do. It's transformational. So what's the answer? How do we be, how do we be a transformational community? Well, let's start with this, what Paul says. Let's share our lives with one another. Let's show up. Let's be here for one another. Let's do haves and needs. Like really, really do it, guys. Haves and needs. Commit to a group or a class. Put 10, put 10, a, put 10 a.m. Sunday on your calendar and tell all the other things that you already have plans. In seasons when you can give and serve and pour out, do so. In seasons when you need help, when you need healing, when you need rest, let us love you. It's not transactional is what I'm saying. If you need let us love you. If you have, help us love others. And we'll do it together. And let's be a community that's being transformed by the Spirit to live like Jesus and display the goodness of God everywhere we go. And when things get hard, and they will, 
and for many of us they are, hold on to the gospel. Welcome the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Hold on to the joy that you have in the middle of it all. And let's do it together. And we'll have the worship team come back up. And we'll live together as people who have a great hope. So here's, for our 10-year anniversary, you're welcome in advance. I'm going to close with a dad joke quality final exhortation. What I'm saying is, this is so dumb. I love it. Straight face. Don't mope because the world is falling apart. Live with hope because God has a plan to put it all back together. And so as we transition to a time of musical worship, and we prepare our hearts to receive communion together, let's take a moment to just be still and let God just come and minister to us right where we're at. Heard a great preacher once, ended his sermon, and he said, this is what I'm asking you to do. Just bring all of where you're at right now to all of where you're at with God right now or, or what you, how you see God right now. Just do the best you can to just bring it all. And I know for some of us, it's our hurt, it's our anxiety, it's our questions, it's our pain. But let's just bring that right now to the Lord. And for others, it's joy. For many of us, it's a mix of all of those things. Just just be real right, right now with God.